Leaders, it's Suzanne A. Wells, and welcome back to another episode of eBay the Right Way. In this episode, I have lots of updates and stories from eBay land, and I continue our study of how 2020 affected consumer buying trends and why eBay sellers should care. Basically, I'm explaining based on in-depth research and reputable sources what consumers are buying online now in 2021 as a result of so many different things that happened in 2020. So if you are interested in what is selling now or opportunities you might be missing, this information will be very useful. Okay, we're going to start off with eBay news. You should have received an email from eBay about item specifics needed by July 12th. That is the deadline. The email said, Keeping your item specifics up to date helps your listings get found on eBay and external search engines. We're adding new item specifics requirements in certain categories to help make sure your listings show up in the right searches. You'll see these item specifics in your listing flow as required soon, so they will be required starting July 12, 2021. After this date, you won't be able to publish new relisted or revised listings in the following categories without the required item specifics. So what does all this mean? eBay is trying to help you here by getting you to change or update item specifics so your listings can be found in searches. This isn't just a random thing eBay decided to do. And if this is not done by July 12th, those listings won't show up. So when you go to your seller hub, you should see over on the left under tasks, item specifics required soon. That's what this is talking about. Now, if we go over to the official page on eBay, they give us the list of categories that this applies to. So this page says, Item Specifics Requirements. Over the past year, we've emphasized the importance of item specifics and how they increase the visibility of your listings on both eBay and external search engines. The more data you give us about what you're selling, the better we can match your item to what a buyer is looking for, either through query search, left-hand navigation filters, or category merchandising pages. So the best example here is when you are searching on eBay mobile for sold listings and you see all of those choices you get, color, condition, category. That's what this is talking about. So as sellers, we use these item specifics one way, but buyers use them to filter down to what they want, to exactly what they want. So if they are looking for a sweater in a size medium that's red, button front cardigan, they can choose all of that through the left-hand navigation so they can see examples or items for sale of exactly what they want. So if you don't correct your listings, you're not going to show up when a buyer filters down to that level. That's why this is important. So you should see on your seller hub, required soon, that's what you need to pay attention to and get those corrected now. So it's not all categories. 
back to the eBay official page about item specifics. It says new item specifics in the below categories are required as of July 12th, 2021 for all new and revised listings. So here are the categories and this may not apply to you at all. That's the great thing. You don't have to worry about it if you're not selling in these categories, but do pay attention to your seller hub where it says item specifics required soon. The categories are business and industrial, collectibles, gift cards, home and garden, media, musical instruments, parts and accessories, sporting goods, and NFTs, which are tokens. It's a digital thing. If you don't know what they are, you're probably not selling them. So these item specific values are available now in eBay listing flows, and we encourage you to update your listings as soon as possible. So that is the official word from eBay. Today is June 1st, so you have between five and six weeks to take care of this. Don't be one of those people that comes on my Facebook group or comments on a YouTube video and says, you know, on July 15th, what happened to my listings? Or in August, why are none of these things selling? This is probably why. So just be the better seller. Take care of that as soon as possible, and you won't have to worry about it. Okay, next up is my response to a YouTube comment this week. I received an email regarding my YouTube channel that I haven't posted a regular Money Making Monday video for seven months. And that is correct. I have not. <laughs> I have mentioned this before, but I study my YouTube analytics to determine what kinds of videos to create. I don't just look at the number of views or how much money it makes. I look at things like viewer retention per video, subscriber retention, how many watchers that aren't subscribers, thumbs up and thumbs down, and on and on. And unfortunately, the regular Money Making Monday videos just don't make the cut. Now, some YouTube creators only look at the revenue produced from their videos. And revenue is determined by a whole cocktail of factors, such as if it was a live stream, the keywords used to drive the ads, things like that. Some creators are only on YouTube to make money, which is fine. Everybody has different objectives. And if you can figure out the algorithm and make money on YouTube, that's a great stream of income. However, my mission is to educate. I feel like I have this internal calling to help people learn this business because it can be life-changing. It's like a heightened awareness, an internal knowing, that if the right information reaches people, they can greatly benefit from it. And I know this not only because eBay changed my life, but it has changed the lives of many of my students and people in my audience. So I'll use that overused phrase, you do you. If you watch other eBay YouTube creators, you'll notice that many of them are more like reality TV, which can actually be manufactured reality because so much of it is staged. Haul videos and shopping videos are more for entertainment than learning. That's why I focus on things that have sold, historical data of things that actually happened rather than let's go shopping and buy a bunch of stuff that a lot of it's probably not even going to ever get listed. And that's great if you enjoy those videos. They get a lot of views. That's just not my scene. 
So I said all of that to say that I spend a lot of time studying my analytics to see what videos the most people watch that get the most comments and likes and that the audience watches most of it to the end. I look at what my audience responds to, not the ads that are generated. My channel is about you, my audience, not my check from Google AdSense. And the bottom line is that the regular Money Making Monday videos are just not a crowd pleaser. <laughs> not as much as the $100 supersize videos. My sales updates and some other formats. And if you're not a content creator, you really don't know how much time is involved in making videos and podcasts. There's a lot of editing, a lot of do-overs, a lot of research about what you're going to talk about and what you're going to present, finding the right images if it's a video. There is so much behind the scenes that happens to make a 10 or 20 minute video if it is a high quality video with historical data. So I have to choose which thing to create that's going to benefit the most people. And it really is all about time. So all of that being said, if you are a member of my Facebook group, the Money Making Monday information is available to you. Every single Monday going back to 2014, you can go through the threads and see everyone's sales for yourself. It's all there for you anytime you want to look at it. So I'm just the reporter and everyone only has 24 hours in a day. So we have to pick how we're going to spend it. So that's my outlook on everything in life is all about time efficiency. And whatever I create, I want it to reach the most people that can benefit from that information. So also when you create videos all the time, you know, three, four videos a week, it just gets monotonous and boring. There's only so much content you can talk about. So that's why you see on YouTube a lot of people that, you know, have these big audiences. That's what they're doing every week. Three and four videos, shopping videos, haul videos, uh, watching them ship their packages. And that's great if you like watching that. But I'm more like the PBS <laughs> of eBay podcasts and videos. It's, it's all about learning. And when you think about it, most people just want to be entertained. You know, they... They don't want to learn anything new. Learning takes effort. It takes time. It takes practice. So um, that's just how I'm wired. I'm not going to do something unless it benefits somebody. So to answer that viewer's question, that's why those videos dropped off is they just weren't as popular as some other formats. But go to my Facebook group. And you can see thousands and thousands of items that sold. And you can up your eBay game by learning from other people. And speaking of learning, I want to share something new I learned this week. Because this is going to be a game changer for me when I go thrifting. I'm going to look for these because I already found two of them. The item is Robert Sabuda pop-up books. And I've been seeing sellers having success with pop-up books on my Facebook group. And this is a niche that I personally have not explored. Now, I did sell thousands of books on Amazon between 2009 and 2014. I've done the whole book business where you have the scanner and you're looking at every single book and I kind of got away from books after that because it was quite the exhausting business. Books are heavy. 
you know, it got to be, okay, we're scanning all these books, filling up our cart, going to the checkout, putting them on the counter so they can be scanned, loading them in the car. You get home, you got to unload them, go through all of them, list them. I sent them into Amazon FBA. So that was a whole process of boxing them up and then getting them ready for UPS to pick up. And to be honest, I just burned out on selling books because it was so many in such a short period of time. I learned a lot doing that business as far as what books sell the best, but I just had to get away from it because it was total book selling burnout and I don't really look at the books anymore. So we're going to revisit that, but Pop-up books are really easy to see on the shelf if you look down on the book because you can see the chunky folded pages. So I took a few minutes to skim through the children's books at Goodwill, and sure enough, I found two pop-up books. But these are not your ordinary pop-up books. Again, the author and illustrator is Robert Sabuda, I hope I'm saying that right, who I had never heard of before. And these are the most intricate, artistic pop-up books I have ever seen. They are truly works of art. Robert Sabuda is called a 3D paper engineer, and once you see his work, you will understand why. And I like to know the background of a brand, an artist, so I did a little research, and this man has been a gifted artist and illustrator since he was a child. And it's a very interesting story of what led him to make pop-up books. It was a trip to the dentist. So here is an excerpt of that story. He says, My passion for books took an unexpected twist after a trip to a new dentist. On a previous visit to have a cavity filled, my old dentist didn't numb my tooth enough and I began to howl with pain. My mother came running in and with a scowl at the dentist, whisked me away to never return. Arriving at the new dentist's office, I was understandably scared. Noticing a wicker basket filled with books, my mother suggested I bring one over for us to share while we waited. I went to the basket and realized right away that these books were special. They were very thick and had hard covers, which to me meant they were expensive. I opened the first one and was shocked and delighted when something leapt right off the page. It was a pop-up book. I was so excited, I forgot all about the dentist. Shortly after that, my mother brought home some old manila filing folders from Ford Motor Company where she worked as a secretary. The folders were perfect for making pop-ups. Everyone started giving me pop-up books as birthday or holiday gifts, and soon I was able to make simple pop-ups by carefully examining these books. So the 3D paper designs in his books don't just pop up. They unfold and create exquisite works of art. It's almost like origami, but there are uh, cutouts in the books. I have them listed in my store if you want to go take a look or just go look on Google Images for Robert Sabuda pop-up books and you will see more about how he creates these. Anyway, I found two of them. Children's books are only $1 to $2 at my Goodwill, and these can sell for over $150 depending on the condition, if it was limited edition, and of course, if it's autographed. The two I found are just good used condition, and I'm pricing them at $30 each according to Terapeak and what they have sold for. So that's a nice profit margin for something really beautiful to work with, easy to store, and easy to ship. 
What can I say? I like selling pretty and interesting things. Moving on to what happened in my eBay store this week. There was some drama, but it's all solved and all is good. I like to go on my feedback page and reply to feedback left. I just think that's a special extra touch. You're communicating with the buyer. They're happy with the item. I like to thank them and just show my gratitude that they purchased from me because there's lots of choices on eBay and they didn't have to pick me. So as I was doing that, to my horror, I see someone has left me a negative. And it was one of those blindside deals where they never reached out. They didn't message me. I had no idea there was a problem. The item was a brand new Calvin Klein belt, leather, reversible, brown on one side, black on the other, and new with the tag. Like there was nothing wrong with this item. So I was really puzzled as to why they left this feedback that said it was cheap quality and, you know, terrible condition and all this kind of stuff. So I went and looked at the buyer's feedback and clicked left for others to see if this is his way of life, which it is. He left negatives for other people saying the same thing. So at that point, I decided, you know what? It's just easier for me to give him his 20 bucks back and ask for a feedback revision. I just didn't want to take the time to get into the whole conversation of, did you mean to leave this for me or for a different seller? Um, you know, explain the problem. What we sent you does not match your comment. I just didn't want to go down that road for $20. So that was a business decision. So I went ahead and refunded his payment. And then I asked for a feedback revision, which is a clickable link right underneath their feedback. And just said, we apologize for the issue with your item. We kindly ask for a feedback revision. Your payment has been refunded. So within five minutes, he revised that feedback to positive and said, good salesperson committed to improving by listening to their customers. Now, had he contacted me before he left that feedback, we could have had a conversation and I still would have listened to him, but he did not give me that opportunity. And that really bothers me when you don't even get a chance to help someone who's unhappy and have a conversation with them. So in this case, that would have fallen on deaf ears anyway, because this is what he does. It's his way of life to leave negatives. So he's one of those buyers that probably shouldn't be buying on eBay. If he's disappointed with everything, he needs to go shop in a regular store. But we can't change people. And all we can do is control our responses to what people do. So that's how I handled it. I'm sure a lot of sellers out there are going to go, oh, why did you do that? You're just encouraging people like this to get their money back and keep the item. And you know what? Um, not my circus, not my monkey. It was 20 bucks. He changed it. I have 100% positive feedback. That was my goal was to get that feedback changed. And I just don't have time for people like this who are crooked and unscrupulous, I'm never going to be able to change them. So this is a way of life for some people, whether it's going into restaurants and complaining about the food so they can get it for free or, you know, whatever their game is, that's just what they do. And so 
<laughs> it happens to everybody. You get blindsided with negatives sometimes and don't even get the opportunity to have a conversation and make things right. So anyway, there might be a backlash on that decision, but um, I'm really not on eBay to teach people lessons or to change how they live. I'm on eBay to provide products that people want, ship them quickly, be able to make money from home, and love what I do. And sometimes you just get a rotten apple and you have to deal with them. Okay, one more quick update and then we will get into the main topic of the podcast. Regarding the premium library, I started the long-awaited course about selling bras, both new and pre-owned. Yes, you can sell pre-owned bras and I have been selling them on eBay for years. This niche offers a lot of opportunities, sourcing opportunities, benefits of selling this particular product online. They're very easy to store. They don't take up much room. They're easy to ship. They're not breakable. They don't require additional shipping supplies. And in my experience, they are rarely returned. I love finding items that have a low return rate. And bras come in an unlimited variety and combination of sizes, brands, colors, styles. It is pretty endless. <laughs> so a lot of opportunities to find high profit bras out there in the world. In this course, I'll explain how to inspect bras before purchasing, what to keep, what to throw back, best brands to resell, most popular styles and features, keywords, photography tips, many different ways to photograph these quickly and easily. I love items I can list quickly. Pricing tips and shipping tips. So if this is a product you are overlooking, you can come take this course and learn about all the money you are leaving on the table. And rest assured, I will keep you abreast of the situation. Okay, sorry, I just couldn't help myself on that one. All right, moving on to the main topic, 2020 Aftershocks. We're going to talk about apparel. There has been a shift from business wear to casual and athletic. I personally saw this in my eBay store. Even now, in June of 2021, business attire just isn't selling for me. Your experience might be different, but this podcast is based on my experience. At this time, my best sellers are casual and athletic wear and intimates like bras and sleepwear and then, of course, swimwear. So I did some research on the clothing market to see if it was just me or if this is happening overall. And I found a very informative podcast by McKenzie and Company titled The Post- pandemic state of the fashion industry. If you are not familiar, McKinsey and Company is an American worldwide management consulting firm founded in 1926 by the University of Chicago professor James O. McKinsey that advises on strategic management to corporations, governments, and other organizations. So in other words, this is a reputable firm that has provided this information. So I'm going to give you some of the highlights of this podcast because this does relate to us selling clothing and apparel in pre-owned condition on eBay. So they start off with the question, what is the state of fashion. And one of the experts replies with, 
It is a challenged state. We've seen a year like no other. It's going to be the worst year for the fashion and luxury industry since collecting any figures. On development, it's unprecedented. It's not comparable to a financial crisis. It's probably closer to what people must have seen during the Great Depression. So it's a really bad year and devastating for the industry. Now, they're referring to the luxury brand industry. Not really what we sell, but there is some overlap. The expert continues, it's clear that athleisure and casual wear sales have seen a huge acceleration over this pandemic, but let's not forget, so has e-commerce in general. In many countries, as of this year, 2021, 40% of all sales will be online. As stores reopen, e-commerce continues to grow. So we think that has been one of the silver linings and one of the areas of opportunity that the industry has been able to play with and work with over this past year. So this is Suzanne talking, not the expert on the podcast. I want you guys to remember that e-commerce means us, eBay sellers, we are reaping the benefits of a surge of online buying and the decline of the public doing their shopping in person in brick and mortar stores. And there is another article by Digital Commerce 360 that talks about all of the brick and mortar stores that filed bankruptcy at the end of 2020 or in 2021. Neiman Marcus is one of them. Now, bankruptcy doesn't mean they're shutting their doors and closing forever. Sometimes it's just protection from having to pay bills they cannot afford to pay. So that's an entirely different topic that I'm not an expert on. But the bottom line is that, like Steinmart, is definitely closing its doors. The pandemic was just the straw that broke the camel's back, and they're going out of business. So when you see these reputable retailers filing bankruptcy and or going out of business completely, that to me says there's a shift where consumers are now buying online, and they're buying from us. So if clothing is in your death pile, you are missing huge opportunities to sell it to a ready-made audience that's waiting right now. Get busy on those death piles because if you've got clothing, especially summer clothing, athletic wear, athleisure, comfortable clothes, that's what's selling and that's what people want. So you are missing opportunities there if those items aren't listed because we all know people can't buy things that aren't listed. The next point is about a newly created word called casualization and it's pretty much just what it sounds like. Apparel has been made more casual. So the expert says it means Dresses and other garments have become much more casual, but that is not an invention of COVID-19. It's a trend we have seen for a long while, moving away from more formal wear, having casual Fridays, not only on Fridays, but also from Monday to Thursday. Of course, working from home without the restrictions that you typically have in an office has an impact on how you dress. On the other hand, we should not forget that we're lacking many occasions for which people dress up. Weddings have been canceled and postponed. Concerts have been canceled. A lot of culture 
and people gathering had to be canceled due to the pandemic. All of that has an impact on how we dress, what we shop for, and how we shop for it. And I saw that last year. My more formal items, the beaded dresses, something that would be a mother of the bride dress or that you would wear to the symphony, very formal wear, just stopped selling because those events weren't happening. So here we are in June of 2021, and the experts have put this in writing that, yeah, that definitely happened. And next, they discuss trends. The expert says, What we've seen through COVID-19 is indeed an acceleration of a lot of the trends that were already underway. Whether you look at e-commerce sustainability, or even athleisure and casualization, these were all trends that we were seeing before the crisis. If anything, they've been amplified over the course of the pandemic. This pandemic has forced a demand to rethink, certainly in the earlier part of the crisis. The second factor that's playing out here is what we wear. The product mix of that has been dramatically different owing to the fact that we're all now spending much more time at home. And all of that has caused a real demand shock in the system. So this is Suzanne talking, not the expert. I have talked to people who were transitioned to work at home. And now here we are a year later and these businesses have figured out that they really don't need people to come to the office. Now, obviously if it's a restaurant or a gym, places like that where you have to have staff on hand, but people have learned how to video conference, how to use Zoom, how to do stuff on FaceTime, how to not need to be in the office, which that filters down to some of these office spaces not being rented because these companies have figured out they don't need everybody there, so they don't need to pay for office space. So it's a very interesting ripple effect But what we care about is what are people wearing? And it's pretty much just waist up dressing. Like, you know, the news reporter who's got on his shirt and tie, but he's got shorts on with it. Because on Zoom, you don't see below the waist in most business settings. Now, here is the interesting part. How the pandemic changed apparel in the workplace. The expert says, we anticipate that nearly 90% of industry executives feel that the working model of the future will be hybrid. People are typically going to be working from home two to three days and the rest of the week in the office. We might see some fluctuating behavior, which is really sort of dressing up and looking your best on the days you are out and being much more casual and cocooned when you're in the home. However, what we are also likely to see is that the new variant of glamour will also come with a degree of comfort. People have realized that clothing that's comfortable, that falls well, that feels good, that is well-made has become much more important given the lives that we've been leading. So that probably is something that will continue. And then the host says, Goodbye, four-inch heels. I can't say that I'll miss them. There certainly seems to be more discussion of sustainability. Is that a trend that's going to transform the priorities in fashion? And then the expert answered, We've seen that transformation underway for a while. In last year's report, we said 
sustainability will be the big topic in 2020. Despite the fact that obviously the coronavirus crisis was the big topic, sustainability still stayed hugely relevant. Okay, I'm done quoting the expert. (laughs) Now for my commentary. So sustainable fashion refers to clothing that is designed, manufactured, distributed, and used in ways that are environmentally friendly. Most fashion today is not sustainable. It is intentionally designed to be consumed quickly at cheap prices, leading shoppers to view clothes as being disposable, wearing them just a few times before throwing them out or moving on to newer and trendier cheap clothes. So brands and garments that are made from natural and organic materials like hemp, linen, and organic cotton are considered sustainable. Clothing made from recycled materials. One I can think of off the top of my head is a brand called 30A, which refers to down by uh, Panama City, Destin, Fort Walton, you know, Highway 30A, that are made from recycled plastic bottles. And I sold one last week. The material is so extremely soft. It's softer than cotton, but they're made from recycled plastic bottles. The website Green Dreamer explains all about sustainable clothing and includes this blurb, which is important to us as sellers of pre-owned clothing. Secondhand or durable clothes. Instead of opting for fast fashion that is cheap and meant to be thrown away quickly, you can be a more sustainable fashion consumer by also responsibly caring for your clothes to prolong their lives or buying secondhand, which keeps clothes out of landfills for longer. Buying higher quality, more durable clothing that you can envision yourself wearing again and again throughout the years, even if it's a little more expensive. So from an eBay seller's perspective, by selling secondhand clothing on eBay, you are helping the environment in two ways. First, keeping it out of the landfill. And second, by not supporting the hugely wasteful industry of fast fashion. So all that clothing that's made in China that you see on eBay that's like the t-shirt that you can pick your color and they're like $4 and they're shipped from China, that's fast fashion. It's made cheap, it's not going to last, and it's created to be replenishable. But If you are a picker going to thrift stores and garage sales and you're finding high quality, durable, used clothing, that is better for the environment and you can make money doing it. So the bottom line on this pandemic aftershocks episode is offer athletic, athleisure, and casual wear. That's what's selling. Casual dresses are back. Sustainable clothing is important to consumers. And my prediction is that trend is going to grow. So if you are already selling pre-owned clothing, you're in the right place at the right time. And if you're not, you might want to learn more about that because as attitudes shift, sustainable clothing and taking care of the planet is going to become more and more important in the future. And as you heard from that green website, the green advocates encourage consumers to buy used to help the planet. Okay, that wraps up another episode of eBay the Right Way. I'm Suzanne A. Wells, and you can find me on YouTube and Facebook. If you want to up your eBay game, make sure to grab a copy of my eBay Bolo handbook 
so you can spot those high profit finds faster. And check out my online school that will hit 400 videos this week. I'll be back on next Tuesday, so make sure you follow me wherever you get your podcasts. Be nice to each other. Make sure you are living the life you want. And have a profitable, productive, and most of all, fun day on eBay. Bye.